The World, I, and Now. That's the chapter, the last chapter of my book, Naive Metaphysics. And my idea today was that I was going to talk about that. The thing is, I don't want to just rehash the arguments that I put forward there. But I will just very briefly say what it was about. I've been talking about possible worlds and the idea that they might be really real in some sense. And I also said that I'm not sure that I actually want to. Well, want to believe, that's not something you say in philosophy, but I don't like the idea. I prefer the idea that the actual world really is what exists and other possible worlds are just what might have been. But in that final chapter, I just pursued an analogy. And the analogy was between the idea that I, as a subject of reference, a human individual, am, or the, the thing called I, is whoever happens to be speaking at the time. So if you say I, you're referring to you. If I say I, I'm referring to me. I is an indexical expression. That's the sort of technical term used in um, philosophical logic. And if we look at the world of facts, just what there is, there are lots of things, there are lots of people, and each of those people is an I. And that is the total story about consciousness, subjectivity, etc. I mean, you can then go into what is consciousness and so on, but the fact is every I, every individual capable of self-reference is a conscious, self-conscious subject. And we can debate whether sort of non-human individuals have consciousness or to what degree they have consciousness, etc. But there seems to be an additional fact that I can't express in language, which just is a tautology, which is that I am GVK. Philosopher Thomas Nagel, in his book, The View From Nowhere, looks at this problem, and I've talked about it before, so I'm not going to go into great lengths. But it seems an additional fact, and yet it's a fact that we cannot express in language. I cannot tell you the fact that I mean, or seem to mean, when I say I am GVK. I'm just telling you my name. Whereas to me, it's like one of the most important facts of all. It's the fact that there is I in the world rather than no I in the world, and the fact that I is this particular person rather than some other person. Well, the analogy between that and the actual world is that well, if you t believe that all possible worlds are real, the actual world is just the world we happen to be in. But in every possible world, there are self-conscious individuals who call themselves we, and who think of their world as actual. So just like in the case of I, it's a difference of perspective and nothing more. And the third example is now. The fact that it is now just looking at my clock, 9.33 in the morning. That will always be true. When you watch this video, it will not be 9.33 on Saturday morning in the UK. It will be some other time in the future. But it will always be true that when I said that, when I made that statement, it was a true statement. Every time is a now actually said in the chapter, in a kind of cheeky way, every time gets its turn to be now. You know, imagine all the time sitting there, waiting waiting patiently, and then finally it's your turn and you are now, and it's gone. That's it. It had its turn and it's gone. I mean, we had the general election, and there was some point where it was absolutely clear the Conservatives had won, and no doubt, David Cameron, the Prime Minister, that will be in his memory forever. 
but there was a time when that was actually happening when it was now and it is no longer now it's just a memory just like everything that ever happens to us ends up as a memory that's if we remember it um so that's perspective as well because you can't in language without just a tautology say what it means that now is nine it's now about nine thirty five two minutes have passed you can't say it in language you see it you see it in the same way that I see that I am GVK so that's this weird fact of perspective that we can't express and yet it's a fact and for me I mean, there are all sorts of theories in philosophical logic about how you analyze these kinds of statement, how you analyze indexical expressions and so on. But they are ultimately reductionist in spirit in, they try to, in that they try to explain away this feeling that there's some extra fact that you can't express in language because they are absolutely committed to the Wittgensteinian formula, the world is all that is the case. And the meaning of a proposition is its truth conditions, and its truth conditions are necessarily something that is fundamentally expressible. There are no inexpressible facts. There are no facts that we can see but we can't somehow explain or, or state. And the fact that I exist well, that was the thing that started the whole thing off. Because in my theory of subjective and objective worlds, what I said was, take the whole world and everything in it, including myself, that is to say, including GVK, and you've got everything. There's no room for anything more. And yet, there seems to be one extra fact above all that, which is that I am GVK. And I proposed a theory which, if you weren't gripped by the problem that the theory was a response to, would seem absolutely mad. And the theory was, there are two worlds. They're identical in every respect. The objective world and my subjective world. And the objective world contains the Crab Nebula and my subjective world contains the Crab Nebula. The objective world contains the camera that's doing this video, and my subjective world contains the camera that's doing this video. They are metaphysically distinct, and yet they are identical in every describable quality. But of course there's one massive difference between them, which is that in my subjective world, the camera taking this video is closer than the Crab Nebula. In the objective world, there is no closer, or rather, whatever is closer depends upon the being that is making the statement. And if there is any intelligent life in the Crab Nebula, on one of the planets in the Crab Nebula, and one of these beings is actually making a video, on their version of YouTube, they would say, well, it would, they probably haven't even thought of me, but supposing they did, they're supposing they pointed in the sky in the general direction of our galaxy, they would say, this camera, my camera, is closer than that over there, that galaxy, whatever name they give to it. So, <clears throat> these are two different worlds, and that was my theory. The best I could come up with. And I'd have to go take a long digression to explain why I rejected so many of the alternatives that you might have thought were less extreme. It was the only consistent theory, and yet the theory itself admitted a fundamental, what I called a metaphysical contradiction between the subjective and the objective worlds. Well, I'm not any longer trying to defend the theory. Yesterday on the bus, another theory came to me and I thought, hey, that's quite a good theory. 
why don't I develop that? And then I thought, well, the second thought came to me, well, it's too easy to make a theory, you know. Okay, I mean, the, the theory of subjective and objective worlds cost me a lot of effort. But at the end of the day, if you really set your mind to it, you can think of 10 theories. You can think of 100 theories. You know, it's not that difficult. Of course, as I've said before in the videos, the whole question is, which of these theories is true? And you can speculate as much as you like. At the end of the day, it doesn't mean a thing if you haven't got a clinching argument. But I actually, okay, so that's all kind of in the past. I'm going back to square one and I'm asking now, why the need for a theory in the first place? What's wrong with the world as it is? The world in which we all believe. The world you don't need a philosopher to understand. Why, why the feeling that it's wrong. It's not the complete picture. That's something we haven't got, we haven't ex understood. The thing that drives a lot of people to religion, but that's not an answer. And science, well, science is just content, content with accounting for the world. And as I also said, the world is dense with fact. An analogy occurred to me. I read somewhere that Every minute, 300 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube. Imagine someone mad enough to want to watch all those videos, to keep up with them. Right? You can't just record them and watch them later, because there's more and more and more. So you need a, like a wall covered with small TV screens, say an inch by an inch and a half. 180 across, 100 down. Um, I've forgotten how I worked that out, but anyway. And all these little screens are showing all the videos being uploaded at the present time. But then, of course, you've got the audio feeds as well. 18,000 audio feeds. What would that sound like? Some kind of cacophony or white noise or some or grey noise or something? And that's just one tiny, tiny aspect of the world. Think of all the different sciences. Physics, chemistry, biology, psychology, history, geography, geology. Nobody can know. Nobody can be an expert in all the sciences. I mean, at one time you maybe could in the 17th or 18th century. All that there was to know, you could actually be an expert in it, but not now. And that's what I mean by saying that the world is dense with fact. It's stupefyingly real. And even the philosopher Ayn Rand, who does nothing get a mention in these kind of discussions, has her principle, existence exists. So, so much for people who kind of attempted to doubt the reality of the world. Or think it's a dream or something like that. It's too real, you know. It's too heavy. But I doubt the world. I do doubt it. I don't accept that picture. And really in the history of philosophy there have been two rival accounts. One has been that the world is stuff, it's matter, it's the ultimately made of the stuff of, that physics describes. And the other account is that it's somehow mental, conceptual or mental, that matter is just an appearance, it's not reality. There's actually a beautiful section in Martin Buber's I and Thou, where he describes in very poetic terms someone who has studied philosophy and he's studied all the systems of philosophy and he, he's followed the account, the materialist account of the world, and he's followed the idealist account of the world. And they both you know, work them up to a fine degree of coherence. 
and then he looks at the two pictures simultaneously and he's just aghast because neither of them ultimately works materialism ultimately doesn't work and idealism ultimately doesn't work whether you work from the inside out as the idealist tries to do or the outside in as the materialist tries to do it's something missing something that doesn't add up and of course you know what do you do when you get two things that you can't quite make sense of you you have a world you have two things they can't do that there's mental substance and physical substance and i've kind of done this with my subjective world and objective world without going into the details you can be a monist or you can be a dualist but dualism doesn't solve the problem, it just names it. And uh, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance now, where um, Phaedrus is grappling with the fact-value distinction. He comes up with a brilliant theory of his own that something else, a third entity, gives rise to facts and it also gives rise to values, which he calls quality. And he makes some comments which actually are relevant that you split a thing in two and you spend the rest of your time trying to stick the two bits together and the mistake was made when you made the split but i don't see an analogy with the materialist and the idealist the realist and the idealist whatever you call them the inside out the outside in accounts of the world All I know is, which I just keep repeating, that I don't believe in the world as it's described. I don't believe that's the final account. And I don't believe it because I know something. I know that I exist. Like Descartes. That is my one single, absolute, immovable point from which any kind of philosophical investigation must proceed. I exist. Therefore, what?